If you talk to anybody who uh, audits their label, they're always owed money. And if nothing else, usually the label holds back enough money that your cost of auditing is such that you won't do it. So that's the business model, is screwing the artists. Their financial practices have been shady since the beginning of time. It's been grandfathered in since the 50s and 60s when rock and roll really started. In the 50s, they were screwing the artists then, but there was much, much less money involved. Then as you start to go into the 60s and 70s, the hit to shit ratio is so bad that they're saying, hey, you know, we can't pay the hit artist because he's paying for all the bad artists. It goes back to how the music industry was set up in the very early stages of the recording industry. Taking advantage of uneducated, easily swayed artists who don't really care about the money. Unfortunately, there's a lot of fallout with um, still with bands getting paid, you know. We had to sue our label to get paid. And they've created this strange, convoluted system that you have to be a lawyer to really understand, or a mathematician. A typical record deal is structured something like this. The record label gives in advance, say, $250,000 to the artist to record an album. The artist then records the album. Suppose that the album sells 500,000 copies at $10 each, yielding $5 million. The record label then takes their cut out of the $5 million, typically 85% of the total sales, leaving the artist with $750,000. But before the artist receives any payments, the label first deducts the advance. In addition, the record label recoups other costs such as recording costs, half the promotion costs, half the video costs, and tour support. This leaves the artist $425,000 in debt to the record label. And then this debt gets carried on to the next album, the next album, and the next album. I don't know if most people have seen long-form contracts. They're insane. And there's all these little, these little things thrown in. It's kind of like legislating, you know, legislature for a government. They put up this big issue, but underneath that issue, there's like 17 other little laws that they threw in that they're not talking about. So when you say yes to this one thing, you're actually saying yes to like 45 other things. There's, there's a worse one. They used to have damage fees with digital downloads. Digital downloads, like at first they were doing that, like they just trying to get away with murder, you know? It's just like, let's leave it in there. Let's see if the lawyer sees it kind of thing. Some other hidden items that the contract includes are packaging costs. They deduct up to 25% of the artist's cut, known as a royalty, to cover the expense of plastic cases and artwork. This cost is even administered to digital downloads where packaging is non-existent. 10% is deducted to cover breakage costs during shipping. This started in the vinyl era, continued when CDs replaced vinyl, and still applies today with digital downloads. The 10% free goods deduction is an antiquated system where retailers purchase 100 albums but are given an additional 10 albums at no charge. Since the artist is only paid on albums sold, they are not compensated for those free albums. This deduction still continues even in a digitally dominated market. Artists generate so much money for so many people that have nothing to do with the creative process at all. There's no, there's no road you can go down that the artist isn't fucked. Most people out there who have jobs, they can go to their boss, ask for a raise. They can leave and go get another job if they're not happy. Musicians don't really have that ability to do that. And by the way, if we don't like, if we don't feel like pushing your records anymore, we don't feel like you're gonna sell, we're not gonna let you go. We'll just kind of put you on the shelf over here. We won't really let you work, but we're not gonna let you leave either. It's like being in a bad marriage. At what point does your husband beat you up or your wife beat you up and you say, I've had enough, I'm leaving. That's the point we're at right now. I love music. I hate the industry. It's an entirely shitty situation. I'm all over the fucking radio. These motherfuckers love me. Why the fuck am I broke? You know what I mean? That's how you felt. Like, God damn. Well, that's the fee you pay to get in the game. Wow. So this piece of paper really holds this much power. They just spin these kids, man. People get fucked over all the time. What do you learn? There's no school for hip hop. Well, Puff is like my idol. 
know what I mean? Like, he's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of Bad Boy, why I wanted to be a hitman. So Puff was like, I want to sign you to a publishing thing. I want to do this. I want to manage you. And I was like, this is like, Puff wants to do this for me? And I'm thinking, I'm like, wait a minute. If I sign all this stuff, that means he gets paid from everything I do. And even if I produce with him, it's like he's getting paid twice. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. I remember we were like in a studio and I screamed at him. It was the first time I screamed at him. I was like, how am I supposed to get any money? And he was like, mm, all right then. It wasn't like it was no beef. And then it was like, all right, so you about to go to this party afterwards. So at that moment, I realized it's a difference between friends and business. He never stopped being my friend because I didn't sign those papers. But like, shit, if you're going to let me do it, I'm going to try. I never told him. I appreciate you for that, you know, because that was like one of the best learning experiences I've ever had in the music industry. We are about to sign our recording contract. Over here, we got all the crystal. We about to pop. They have fucking clauses in these shitty contracts that say, we're only gonna pay you 15%. In that 15%, the label's charging you for every fucking thing that takes place. Yeah, you see, we getting DDoS joint down there now. Proof. The artist has to pay everybody, the producers, the songwriters. Every dime they spend, they're either gonna charge you half or 100%. So most of us, including myself, had no clue what the fuck that meant. All these motherfuckers with the shitty paperwork, you gotta, your money's gotta go to all uh, them. Yeah. Damn, we only getting 12 cents off a dollar? And out of my 12, I gotta pay you, 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 and you? What the fuck? Damn, can you at least put some Vaseline on it? Can we have some wine and cheese before? God damn, like, what's happening here? You have a lot of kids coming from these inner cities that never even seen $10,000 cash before. So if you have a person that's coming to you like, here's 20000 sign to me, I'm gonna put your album out. They're not looking at no legal team where like, let me call my lawyer and make sure that this deal is right. You're taking the 20000 you're gonna sign the contract, and you're gonna figure it out later on when the money's gone. It's too much coming at them too fast. A lot of people just are so thirsty for a platform that they sell themselves short. You just see a big label and you're like, they wouldn't do me wrong. Where do you learn it? There's no school for hip hop. You know, I definitely signed some bad contracts in my time. Some still pending. Bound by a piece of paper. It make you just think like, wow, do this piece of paper really hold this much power? You dangled like this fucking career in my face and like, yeah, I wanna do it. Of course I'm not reading this shit. Like, not saying like it's the smart thing to do, but you're young. But at the same time, you're a grown man. You know how to read too. You chose not to read that country. So I don't, I don't get when people say, like, oh, don't sign with such and such, them. they be fucking people. Like, hell, they ain't fuck nobody. Like, you had it, you could have read it. You chose not to read it. You look at the fact that they put it's two big stacks of money up here next to the country. This is all you're gonna ever get. You ain't look at the country. You have the frustrated artist who wakes up one day and realizes that I'm all over the fucking radio. These motherfuckers love me. Why the fuck am I broke? And then they explain to you, like, this is why. Paragraph 64, clause B says, you don't get shit. When you're an artist, you gotta make hot records. That's what your job is to do. If you're not making hot records, we have to move on. It's nothing personal, it's business. Even as an executive, if I'm not putting out hit records or if I'm not signing hot artists, they're gonna be like, I think we could find somebody else to fill your position. Everybody at the label could get fired just like the artist could get dropped. You could go to war with your label, and the label war is probably like one of the major contributions to failed careers. At the end of the day, I'm trying to take care of my family too, just like you are. So we'll make sure life better than mine. You start arguing with these executives and they just fucking turn the switch off on your ass. Don't like you anymore. First thing you're gonna say is, well, let me go. They don't do that shit. Well, obviously all the cash money we've seen go through this. <laughs> Tygo claims that Birdman owes him like $12 million. You know, hey, Birdman, you robbed me, so I'm going to put it on a loud speakerphone and tell everybody that you robbed me. And everybody else that comes to you is going to be very careful about how you, you know, they do those contracts. If anybody can take in stuff personal and have stuff going, they might not want to choose this job. Literally everything in the industry, they will, they will try to get over on you if you let it slide. I'm the type, like, I will pull up to complex. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, where's the footage? You know, to be a boss, sometimes you have to be a bitch. 
work a nine to five. So you don't get like, you know, your insurance and you know, your, your income tax check. You don't get none of that shit. Publish it is like, it's kind of like your paycheck for writing. You get paid for when people listen to your music over and over again. Those are checks that just come. You don't want to give that shit up. Sometimes you might have to like break a little piece off to somebody, you know what I'm saying? But make it worth it. Don't give it all up, ever. Ever. Kanye. Talk about Kanye and the publisher. To manage him, I had an opportunity to own some of his publishing. I didn't want to do that to any producer I managed because they were my startup guys. And Kanye was a sample producer. He took a sample from Jay-Z, sample from this music, and then you put it together. I was going to pretty much let him know that you're not going to make no fucking money in your royalties with all these samples you're doing. I rearranged the deal for everybody to where he got his publishing back. The industry just wants to rate and take. Labels should do what's fair. And that's why the artists today are saying, fuck you, record company. And they should. Everybody's trying to figure out how to get that money, even though the sales have dwindled. Yeah, I remember this one time I met these execs. <laughs> like, he brought us to the house, laid, everything's crazy, and gave us this whole big pep talk speech. And then literally like, I think it was eight months later, we went and met the same guys, but this time in the office. And then he came in and gave us the whole same exact spiel. Like the same exact speech, like, like the introduction, everything. And that's when I knew like, man, like they just, they just spin these kids, man. I'm 19, he's 21, like, we're young, so a lot of people try to take advantage of us. Yeah. But the thing is, they don't realize they that don't, we, act, we, we already know, like, we already know what's up. I'm so scared to sign my name and shit. I'm scared to get your autograph, let alone sign a contract. It's kind of like old school versus new school. Like most kids now feel, I don't need to sign for a label. They have all this amazing music, and I'm like, I know some people, you wanna, and he's like, no, I, I, I just wanna put it out myself. When we were coming up, we didn't foresee MP3s, but somebody did because in the contracts we were signing, they would say things like, you're making records for cassettes, CDs, and any form in the future. That line meant a lot. All of a sudden, iTunes showed up, and now we're fighting our contracts because we didn't take time to study what was in it. Somebody else did. Make sure before signing anything to have somebody look over it just to make sure you just don't sign your life away. A lot of artists from day one, they walk into a shitty situation, shitty paperwork, shitty deals, shitty people around them sometimes. In my case, we had the shitty paperwork. We went beyond that and we, we sold a lot of fucking records. You've seen MC Hammer lose, what, 20, 30 million dollars? Like, it could happen. We ain't know nothing about anything. I'm doing this shit. That was my first $100,000 check. At that point, we just started balling. And that's what you do it for. They give us money to do this, and we get to go shopping. And, and I was like, oh shit, this is real, and I'm broke. You check your account, it's like, where did that go? Shit woke you up fast. Really, really fast. The day we got our first set, we ran out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God, that's hilarious. We got our first peso, we ran out of gas on the yeah, freeway. We, got we had to walk gas. all the way to the gas. It was like, how many miles? It was a lot of miles. Man. It was hilarious, we, had to walk. we were so happy. Yeah. I was driving too. <laughs> yeah. I was so happy, I, went. Yeah. I didn't even look at the yeah, gas, I didn't even drunk. look at the gas meter yeah, on the freeway. I'm like, hold on, what's wrong with the car? <laughs> Looked at the gas, I'm like, oh. oh. It was four. It was four hundred. Yeah. But it was four forty because yeah. maybe he gave us like a tip too. <laughs> First pay show ever was four hundred forty dollars. Yeah. For a young artist that hits big, nine times out of ten, they're nearly not prepared for the real world. How do you expect an eighteen-year-old kid who's never had any background in business to come out and do anything else? But you know, hey, I want a nice car. You know, I want to look good, and you're in that stage. Man, I done spent $700 on some shoes, man, multiple times. This is more expensive than my Rolex. This was. Mm -hmm. I done bought an iced out grill, 
Lost it in the same week. Jewelry, put gold teeth in my mouth. Diamond earrings, gone. Weed, women, bins. Five-star restaurants and stupid shit like that. My shoe game is ridiculous. My shoe game is like over twenty thousand. He like he like a lot of the um the Gucci shoes and the Z look. I call these trophies. Every pair of shoes is over five hundred dollars. When I was younger, I'm thinking like, okay, like they give us money to do this, and we get to go shopping and get this outfit, and we're going to dinner with different people, and it's like, oh yeah, you guys order whatever you want, and then you realize like, oh like we were paying for that. So you thinking like, oh, like we're getting treated well. It's like, oh no, that's all part of your budget, which you have to pay back. Learning that was like real interesting. Oh my God, it's like, where does the money go? You know what I'm saying? Once it's gone and you wake up in the next morning, you're like, damn, bro, you probably shouldn't have did that. But then you do it all over again. Cause you know, it's life and you need stuff to rap about cause it's, it's lit. You gotta get to the point where you're making money way faster than you're spending it. After we did Jay-Z American Gangster. That was my first $100,000 check. I've never seen that many zeros on a check with my name on it, like, at one time. I said, I got a fucking $100,000? I'm buying everything. There's no way you can adjust to that. People can tell you, like, this is gonna happen, but what the fuck are you telling me? I got, I just, just got the biggest check ever. I'm buying mad shit. Next thing you know, like, you check your account. It's like, where did that go? That shit gone. Even if they were to tell you, all right, trust me, you're going to get this money. You're going to want to go buy this. And then you're like, I'm not going to do it. But then sure enough, you do exactly what they said, you know. But and then you realize, OK, like, the water's hot. Let me not put my hand in there. But I had to feel that it was hot, you know. Artists who hit big very fast get what I call the gazoo head, the big head on the little body. Next thing you know, they're walking around, they want green M&Ms backstage, the towels have to be warm, and they're basically spending up all their potential money that they would have earned. That's how you end up with a lot of artists who don't see a dime after they basically work their butt off. I've seen tons of people lose all their money. You've seen MC Hammer lose, what, 20, 30 million dollars, like, it could happen. Like, it's crazy, cause like, <laughs> we're young. Yeah. We got our first check, and we went, we did a lot of shopping, and they seen that. So now, you know, we're gonna get a financial advisor, all that stuff, make sure we don't spend all of our money on stupid stuff. I think I got $20,000, I think that was my advance, and it was probably gone in 20 days. Got jewelry on, I got I got a nice chick next to me, I got rental car hookups and all that, but I, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pay the rent next month. Shit woke you up fast. Really, really fast. We were like, we were broke anyway. And we recorded an album. Next thing you know, we're sitting on about $250,000. We said, look, let's just stay broke. Let's not act like we got money. Because, you know, Oakland's a kind of a wild town and shit. A lot of drug dealing, a lot of wild shit going on back then. And we get a call from Jive Records. And Jive Records is like, hey, um, you know, we're interested national distribution, so we, we did a deal with Jive Records. The album goes out, it just sells crazy, crazy, crazy. Life is too short with the album. And we still aren't allowing ourselves to enjoy the money. We're like, man, let the company build up. And then the fucking check for Life is Too Short comes. It's like, like six, seven, eight hundred thousand. After that, we're like, fuck this shit. I'm like, I want a fucking new Benz, I want a fucking house, fuck this shit. So we just, at that point, we just start balling. Now, I'm more interested in spending money in like big stuff like restaurants to open and anything that I could add to my brand. Especially being in this contract where my music is controlled, I had to branch off and find other ways to make money. Jimmy Iovine told somebody, I'm gonna say Snoop Dogg, like when you first get your big paycheck, make sure you get a studio. Like, that's very important because that's gonna generate the bucks later on. And I had that, mi that mindset when I got signed. I didn't just go out and buy anything. Like, I bought a studio, like, immediately. But we just had to really sit back and, like, put the money to good use. We started putting money in videos and things like that that, that moved the, the project forward, you know? You're gonna, like, wild out. You're gonna buy all this jewelry that you've seen your idols and your rappers that you look up to have. And that's what you do it for but you just gotta be smart about it. Some people don't get another chance. You can't like 
get your first two checks and then spend half of it on a chain. <laughs> After the real shit, I'm like, fuck, I should have saved my money. What was I thinking? A great team is one of the most significant things an artist can have in their career. In order to be a dynasty, you have to put the right personnel together. I didn't have a good taste in my mouth about who was inside of the industry. He had the best musicians in the world. That was the illest move anybody ever seen in hip hop. How dare you? I got a situation, let's do something. Have your team in place and make sure that you can trust them with your life. You will never accomplish the highest level alone. When I first started, you know, but I would have like a guest list of 30 people. And I remember one of my first concerts, I was opening for Red Man and Cool G Rap. Some of my friends went into one of their dressing rooms and stole their stuff off their rider and ate their food. I ended up having to pay for it. The promoter was like, we charging you. We know that was your homies. I was not ostracized, but I felt, you know, bad. And it just was one of those things where it was growing pains. Yeah, that happens all the time that like rappers blow up and they got all kinds of weird people around them. You know, you have your friends, but you can't bring 10 of your friends with you on tour all the time. The first thing I, I tell an artist is have your team in place and make sure that you can trust them with your life. If you do blow up, this could be serious money and you want to make sure you know where every penny is. Most artists get in the game and they hire somebody they trust. Now, the person you trust isn't always the person to be in that position. It's the homeboy manager. It's not a real manager that's out there that has success with various artists. You know Raphael, huh? And Raphael, he's your man. It's the man who don't know his ass from his elbow either. Raphael's loyal. He's trying to blow his artists up, so he's going to ask the most dumbest shit, want the most ridiculous shit, and support anything that that artist wants. So they take advantage of homeboy management, of Raphael from the beginning. And then 10 years later, they broke. And you like, man, these are my homies, and you don't want them to feel like you ain't real no more. But you know, at a certain point, you recognize that it could cost you not only just your money, but opportunities in your career. When they come in, they're gonna be around 10 people, and 10 people turn into five. Then they're just hanging around with two people, and those are the two people that are really doing something that's helping them move forward. When you do have those people who want to participate in the music business with you, like who really has the skills, and that's his business. The philosophy that I would always tell Cass is like, I can only give you but so much opportunity. You're gonna have to truly have the skill, the talent, and the desire to do it. I didn't have a, a good taste in my mouth about who's inside of the industry and who really loves rap music, who got a passion about the art. Let me tell you when the whole wide industry paid attention to Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey Hussle is a G. He sold his mixtape for $100. How dare you fucking sell a mixtape for $100? And it blew us all out the frame. But you did it. Me? That means you don't even have to sell a lot. I heard Jay-Z bought 10 of them. Nipsey Hussle, in my opinion, was like the leader of the free world. He was, he was the leader of like independent artists. My name is Nipsey Hussle. I'm a rap artist, an entrepreneur, a author, producer, and you know, a radical. I like his music. I like what he represents for the West Coast and the culture. And I think he's a very smart businessman. His influence, you know, was so huge when it came to him dropping those hundred dollar CDs, which was really like a publicity stunt in a sense, because people were so shocked that it was a hundred dollars. They're like, well, it must be good then. That was the illest move anybody ever seen in hip hop. When I first got out to LA, you know, I really wanted to work with a, a LA based artist, and he was the first artist I really wanted to work with. We trying to build the same production, songwriting. Yeah. Man, at first I thought Dallas was like an A&R industry nigga, trying to like get a promotion or something by fucking with an artist. And that's no shot on Dallas, that's just my assumption on the industry at that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's 
Alicia Fire right there. I seen what Dallas was doing, and I seen how he's moving. He was just like, you know, I got a situation. Let's do something. As a new artist, you're not going to be able to get Timberland or Pharrell or all these people on the phone when you're new, but I could get you in the studio with these people. Going to the club and kicking it with him and going OT and just vibing, being on the scene, fucking with Dallas. You see who a person is, like, all right, this nigga be in the studio for real. He, he really with the music. So it made me separate him from my bias. By the way, it wasn't easy to get Nipsey Hustle to partner up. We just had certain terms that we wanted, and Atlantic was ready to meet us and become partners on the terms. Y'all got it. banging music loud. Yeah, turn it up loud. I just chose my label, not even because of the money or anything else, because you got to go off of how they talking to you. So from what they said to me, it just seemed like they believed in me the most. We have a great team behind us yeah. that's strong and solid. And it. We yeah. have a lawyer, of course. And we have, we yeah. have a couple of other people that are, that are in our corner, you know what I'm saying, that are looking over mm -hmm. and teaching us yeah. the business side of things. A great team is one of the most significant things an artist can have in their, in their career. Because at some point, you recognize that you will never accomplish the highest level alone. You're sort of bread and butter at a certain point. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to me about the business? We have had total silence. After you load up. You want some pizza or something? That was it. That was it? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Nah. I feel like I'm about to do the same thing I just did.